Um, my name is Shirley Cates. I'm the international. I'm the uh, coordinator of the international committee of. Just introducing myself from another organization. I'm the coordinator of the international committee. I work with our co-chairs um, to keep the uh, National Lawyers Guild International Committee running and to help uh, build and support the work of our many numerous subcommittees and members uh, working to achieve international justice, counter US imperialism and corporate impunity. Um, so with that being said, this webinar is focusing on um, holding the US accountable for human rights violations, specifically through international uh, advocacy and the UPR or the Universal Periodic Review process. Um, over the past year, many National Lawyers Guild members have been involved in an effort to bring urgent human rights violations in the United States to international attention through the United Nations Human Rights Council's Universal Periodic Review or UPR process. Um, there were some unexpected and unavoidable delays in the process this year due to the coronavirus pandemic, um, but it did proceed uh, in November through mostly virtual sessions of this year. The UPR is a unique process through which the human rights record of a country is reviewed by other United Nations member states and countries are reviewed every four to five years. The member states then make recommendations to the country under review, which the country should in theory accept and implement. The United States was reviewed on November 29th, 2020. And so in this webinar, we'll be discussing key takeaways, strategies and organizing to challenge US violations of human rights and international fora. And we'll be hearing from NLG members who have been very much involved in this process. Um, to discuss their experiences and analysis and what more can be done to draw attention to US domestic and international human rights violations. I'm just going to go through the speakers that we'll be hearing from and give all of their introductions and then we'll begin with the first speaker. So um, the first speaker today is Carrie McLean, who is a member of the National Lawyers Guild International Committee Steering Committee and chair of its Africa subcommittee. She also serves as the International Mechanisms Consultant for the U.S. Human Rights Network and previously was the USHRN's Women's Rights Working Group co-chair. Uh, in, that, in that position, she, coordinated, she coordinates and coordinated this year all aspects of the UPR advocacy process with USHRN and oversees the network's work with the Inter-American Commission and work with other UN mechanisms. Um, we'll be hearing from Martha Schmidt, who is also a member of the steering committee of the National Lawyers Guild International Committee. She worked with an NLG, IADL, People's Action Institute, and Rights and Democracy Institute to submit a report on the right to health, how financing affects the right to health care in the United States, um, exposing the relationship between privately financed and commodified health care and the highest number of global deaths from SARS, uh, COVID-2 or COVID-19. Um, internationally. We'll be hearing from Joel Kupferman, Chair of the National Lawyers Guild Environmental Justice Committee, who serves as Executive Director of the New York Environmental Law and Justice Project. He worked to raise environmental justice issues at the UPR with several other NLG members, including Natalie Segovia and Kurt Thornblad. Um, we also hope to be hearing today from Jeannie, from Jeannie Mirror, who is co-chair of the NLG International Committee and president of the International Association of Democratic Lawyers. She submitted a report on the United States' failure to put into place effective measures to ensure the right to vote. And uh, the circumstances surrounding this year's election highlight the urgency of this matter. Jeannie may be delayed in her participation or be held up or unable to participate because she actually has filed a major voting rights case in Georgia challenging the purging of hundreds of thousands of voters from their rolls. And she has a hearing in that case um, that was urgently filed and it's coming up this Thursday. So she's facing a number of serious deadlines today, specifically in her work to secure voting rights, the very topic of her report on the UPR. So we do hope to be hearing from Jeannie um, when she is able to join us. So with that being said, um, that's enough for me. And I'd very much, uh, very much honored to turn it over um, to Carrie McLean to begin the uh, panel presentations. Welcome, Carrie. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Carrie McLean. 
As Charlotte mentioned, I work for the US Human Rights Network, coordinating the work with international mechanisms, such as the various UN mechanisms, as well as with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. For the UPR, I coordinated the advocacy of dozens of civil society organizations that are members of our network. On November 9th, the United States Human Rights Record was reviewed by UN member states as part of the Universal Periodic Review or UPR process. The UPR is a mechanism to assess the human rights records of all governments and to foster accountability. The US was previously reviewed in 2011 and 2015. The UPR is a three hour interactive dialogue facilitated by the 47 members of the Human Rights Council and they're referred to as a UPR working group between a government delegation from the country under review, in this case, the US and other UN member countries. Countries can submit written questions to the government delegation in advance of the in-person dialogue. At the beginning of the review session, the government delegation has the opportunity to speak and they usually describe human rights conditions in the country and respond to any questions submitted in advance. During the dialogue, any UN member country can ask questions and make comments and recommendations to the country being reviewed. Recommendations are a really important component, component of the review because the country under review has to respond to each one. The UPR process has several stages and there are opportunities for civil society to get involved at each stage. For example, there's a stage where the government consults with civil society as it prepares its own report to submit to the Human Rights Council. The Trump administration only made one consultation with civil society that I'm aware of. By contrast, the Obama administration held multiple consultations with civil society. The Trump administration submitted its report very late. It seems that the report was submitted in August of this year. The report omitted important information. For example, there was no mention of COVID-19 even though by that time more than 100,000 people had died of COVID and the disease had had a, dis a disproportionate impact on historically marginalized communities such as black and Latinx people, indigenous peoples, transgender people, sex workers, Im immigrants and individuals living at or close to the poverty line. In addition, the, the report misrepresented facts beginning with its assertion that there's no systemic racism in law enforcement in the US to its description of how migrants are treated by the government. Another component of the process is, is the submission of stakeholder reports. Civil society organizations should research and write reports on human rights issues that are then submitted to the UN. Civil society groups contributed more than 100 submissions, about 140 reports in total. The US Human Rights Network created an executive summary report that distills the 70 plus reports submitted by network members and partners covering a range of human rights issues, including water, food, housing access, systemic racism, mass incarceration, immigration, and violence against women, children, and sex workers. So uh, Jeannie's and Marty's reports are part of that executive summary report as well. And that can be found on our upr2020.org website. The United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights then prepares a summary of the stakeholder reports. They also prepare a compilation of any relevant information about the country's human rights record from other UN bodies. The review of the country will take into account the country's national report, the stakeholder summary, and the compilation of information from various UN bodies. Another important step is lobbying. So many reports are sent to the UN and therefore every issue is not going to make it into the UN stakeholder summary or brought to the attention of the UPR working group. This is one reason why lobbying is really important. Through your lobbying, you might be able to make sure that your issues are raised during the interactive dialogue. You can prepare a briefing paper that's one or two pages long that you'll share with embassies and diplomatic missions and you give them questions to ask or recommendations that you'd like them to make to the US on the day of the review. Civil society voices, whether through reports or lobbying are essential to ensuring that the state of human rights in the United States is accurately reflected. I don't know if you had an opportunity to watch the UPR session, but if not, you can watch the recording of it on UNTV. We provided a link to the UNTV site on our website, upr2020.org. 
The US presentation during the UPR session was pretty much a repetition of what was in the report. The UN member states on their part overwhelmingly called for the US to address systemic racism and police brutality, to ratify treaties, to abolish the death penalty, and to establish a national human rights commission amongst other things. I'll end here, but uh, let me know if you have any questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carrie, um, for this very informative uh, report and very informative discussion of the UPR process and uh, your work in the US Human Rights Network's work uh, in this regard. Just to note that the links that Carrie mentioned have been placed in the chat. So that's a link to the upr2020.org, which is that central resource for information, as well as to the UN web TV video of the UPR sessions for the United States. We've also put in the chat links to the reports that were submitted um, that Martha and Jeannie worked on as part of their work. And so with that being said, um, I just want to um, I just want to turn it over now to our second presenter, who is uh, Martha Schmidt, uh, to discuss uh, her work around the UPR and her work ar um, around international mechanisms, advocacy for healthcare justice, et cetera. And I believe that uh, Marty also has a PowerPoint presentation that she's going to be sharing with us today. So thank you again, Carrie, and welcome, Marty. Marty, just checking that you're ready to go. Yeah, can can you see the PowerPoint? <laughs> Not yet. I don't see the PowerPoint, oh. just see you. Um, okay, if you see. just go to the bottom of your Zoom window, you should see a, a green button. It says share screen. I did that. Um, maybe I did it in the wrong sequence. Maybe you just canceled the share after you started it. Uh. Mm. All right, let me try again. Okay, great. Okay, let me make sure that you can share. Let me it make says sure host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, now you should be able to share. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> Just a minute here. Trying to fix it and yeah. causing more issues. But yes, okay. now it should be okay to share. Okay, great. So here's uh, what I wanted to say about shadow reporting on our topic, financing and the right to health care. So just a couple of comments about how I see the UPR. I think it's an opportunity under the charter for civil society to advocate directly to affect foreign relations, peace and human rights, and a mechanism for bringing movement demands through NGOs to another level of policymaking. Also, of course, a way to leverage power and find allies when governments don't represent people's interests and a voice for people who are harmed by state policies and corporate acts that violate human rights standards. Just, you know, a recap on US government duties. It has both duties to the residents and citizens of the US, and as well as duties to the whole world, erga omnis. And of course, we have our supreme law of the land uh, constitutional provision that refers to treaties. And we also have a duty, uh, our government has a duty to respect customary international law. Um, here we're in this UPR process, we are referring often to treaties, but also customary law, such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And with respect to the right to health, um, that encompasses the right to health care and is also a component of a separate right to an adequate standard of living. Uh, also, I want to stress that human rights are universal, indivisible, and interdependent, something that our government seems not to understand. And briefly to mention some guild history uh, milestones that I think are uh, not only pertinent to this UPR, but also to 
the, um, my focus on the right to health. As some people might know, the UN, uh, the the Guild was involved with the UN founding conference in 45 and was one of the organizations that pushed for human rights to be incorporated into the UN Charter in the preamble, as well as uh, for language in Article 68 and 71 in the Charter, which uh, refer to the competency of ECOSOC, of the Economic and Social Rights Council, and to the need for consultation by states with civil society. I've also in another era in 95 joined um, another activity that had to do with the rights to health and life. Um, and that was the guilds work with other organizations in an international petition campaign asking the General Assembly to obtain an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice on the legality of nuclear weapons. And then we've also, our, um, the International Committee and other parts of the Guild have made strong statements against the use, US use of unilateral coercive measures, which are currently violating other states' human rights, especially the right to health. And then coming up to the periodic review on November 9th, which is the third cycle um, of review of the United States. Just to talk a little bit about the process and my experience, um, you know, after, as I was selecting the topic um, on the right to health, I par participated or joined the healthcare working group of the Human Rights Network, as well as the UPR task force. And this is, these are the or parts of the organization where I, I was most involved. And part of my work in, involved reading the manuals and materials on how to write the report or the and formatting and style of reports and previous civil society reports. Um, also, I ex, extensively collaborated with the chair of, of the uh, healthcare working group who had uh, participated in the two previous cycles was on the board of two uh, coalitions of health uh, rights advocates. And so it was very helpful to me to work with somebody who had a lot of experience and gave um, you know, suggestions and information about previous cycles and uh, the process. Um, also, I obtained uh, or sought um, suggestions and in, uh, information from groups uh, working on healthcare as a human right who are outside of the human rights network and outside the guild. So to talk about the report a little bit, um, how financing affects the right to healthcare in the US. Um, it was, I think, really important that the, the reports um, mine and uh, other people's were filed um, under the US Human Rights Network Aegis um, because it has much greater impact to work collaboratively. And those were filed in September of 2019. This is a very long process. Um, I started this process in the spring, late spring of, of 2019, just so that people have an idea of of how much time can be in, um, taken up by this. Um, then the Guild with others submitted the report because we combined with more, more organizations, we could submit a 10 page report um, and the, the organizations, the coalitions have previously been mentioned and as well as the IADL. And it was helpful to have the IADL um, to work with because of their location and help in lobbying the Geneva missions. We also did a couple of other um, short reports. One was a two page summary um, of that report and an addendum to the summary on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, which was unknown when we did the report. Um, our report was, which was called Joint Submission 1, JS1, was mentioned in the um, stakeholder summary report, which came out in March of 2020. 
and the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights specifically mentioned uh, issues that we'd raised about inequality in healthcare um, and um, bankruptcies and um, mortality rates related to inequality in, in several paragraphs of the stakeholder report. So that was very satisfying to see that we had an, an impact. Um, then after um, we filed our reports before the official report, which was kind of odd, um, which didn't come out till the August 13th. Um, as Carrie mentioned, it was very, you know, it was really quite sad as far as uh, something you could be proud of from a uh, government. Um, it didn't mention the pandemic at all. It didn't mention how financing affects the right to health care. It denied that international human rights law gives women a right to abortion. It was really quite, and of course had a lot of um, material about the hierarchies of rights, which is totally wrong. Um, then because, um, you know, getting to the issues about lobbying, which Carrie mentioned, um, we uh, in the healthcare work group uh, wanted to figure out who to approach since we had decided we weren't going to reach out to all 47 members of the um, council. So we looked at the um, prior questions uh, or recommendations that have been brought up in the past two cycles. And so we checked out which states had expressed interest in health care. Um, we also looked at the states whom we thought would be um, especially sympathetic to our concerns um, who were states targeted by the US for unilateral coercive measures. Um, and those included Venezuela and Cuba. And so we selected 25 states to send personal letters and we sent those by email on several dates starting, in, uh, starting on October 18th and included our summary and report. And then we had uh, one meeting with a, a diplomat from Namibia who had requested um, to meet with us. And um, we, we saw at the UPR itself on November 9th that uh, 14 states we had contacted made recommendations on health care um, of the total of 23 states that made recommendations or comments on health care. And those folk and those comments and recommendations focused on universal access, equal care, and equitable care. Just to talk a little bit about the content, um, how financing affects the right to health care in the US, and then the recommendations which we put into the report. Um, we we made the point that the financing systems violate human rights standards, that they're inadequate, inequitable, and un unsustainable. Um, we also mentioned and developed the uh, relationship of uh, healthcare financing to the right to an adequate standard of living. We discussed specific violations uh, relating to lack of universal access to care, unaffordable care, discriminatory and unequal care, and care that's not of the highest quality, but dependent on the ability to pay. We talked about the latitude in the system that allows um, uh, physicians not to accept Medicare and Medicaid, and some other uh, specific uh, issues related to the single payer systems that we have, including the veterans care and Indian Health Service. We requested uh, the recommendations to basically very simple, but not easy to get. One, for a publicly funded national dialogue on healthcare as a human right and on the single payer financing and support for national single payer finance um, legislation with health as a human right to cover all residents.
inadequate financing. We looked at this, the um, failure of the US to commit maximum available resources so that each resident can have the right to health care. We developed the problem of that although the outlay in the US is the highest in the world, 18% of the budget, it misallocates resources. And we specifically mentioned how it reinforces inequality. For example, lower per capita funding for the Indian Health Service, funding denied for reproductive health care, classes of people excluded such as immigrants, insufficient targeting, inequitable care, to minority and vulnerable populations who have inferior health outcomes and just absence of funding, such as for mental health care. In the, in, on the issue of equity, we looked at, uh, and financing, we looked at how healthcare is funded from general taxes, now relying on income and social security, income taxes, progressive social security, only a proportional tax and the gross reduction in revenue from corporate tax declining to 21% in the 2017 tax cuts and the complete absence in the US of tax uh, on capital sources, capital gains or wealth that shifts the burden further onto lower income people and particularly those um, income and social security taxes. And then something that everybody experiences also directly in the US, the user fees the premiums, deductibles, co-payments, and the in, inadequate coverage, of, otherwise known as underinsurance, which especially burden people in the three bottom quintiles, basically all people below the median, especially. Then we looked at unsustainable financing and the commodification of health as, it, as a human rights issue, um, particularly the, just the idea that um, having healthcare in, in, in a profit um, motivated system means that we can never have the human right to health satisfied. It's just antithetical to a human right to health. And then the whole problem, which now is of much more uh, noted by the UN rapporteurs, the, the, develop, the privatization problem and what has already been going on is that care has been diverted um, by privatization into new programs that um, try to rack Medicare and um, veterans care, which are single payer systems. So basically guaranteeing Congress guarantees profits to private companies and raises administrative costs. Then, you know, two things that are really, really uh, noticeable about the United States that the income and wealth inequality is marking a decline in the entire standard of living and affecting universal access, as well as the increasing um, mortality rates of lower income people um, and with the rising of income and wealth inequality. I'm interested in future uses of our report and how we can work beyond uh, the UPR process. Um, and one area I particularly would love to have a conversation about is relating healthcare to those rights associated with an adequate standard of living, um, which are set forth in Article 25 of the Universal Declaration. And I'm really, interested in um, seeing how we can start to address the issue of commodification um, of many goods and services which are necessary um, to human rights and particularly looking at healthcare, water, food and housing and the um, connection between income security um, to all these other rights and its interdependence with labor rights. And I think ultimately what I saw in this process in my interactions with, um, with organizations and what I'm seeing now, because it doesn't seem like we're any closer to having um, 
healthcare as a human right in the United States is the importance of the ideological struggle. And I've just laid out a few areas that I think are really important for um, further discussion on means testing and human dignity, social bonds of commonality, equal freedom in making decisions, uh, really important underlying issues of human rights. That wraps that up. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Marty, for that presentation and for those comments. Um, and I, I think that people were able to see the the screen share um, that through throughout. Um, but I just wanted now to um, thank Marty for those comments and also move to Joel Kupferman, our next speaker, who's part of the program. Um, Jeannie is going to be trying to join us. She is um, still swamped with these deadlines, but we'll provide people with an update on that later. And uh, we'll also certainly host a webinar with Jeannie specifically speaking about these voting rights issues and some of her colleagues that are also working on, are working on voting rights. So with that being said, very honored to turn it over now to Joel to discuss some of the environmental human rights aspects of the UPR work. Joel, you are muted right now. Okay, here I am. Just give me one more second, please. Absolutely. And again, just to remind everyone that even though that we're on a webinar format, but we'll, we're happy to have your participation and your comments. Um, if you have a comment or a question, if you don't want to share it yourself, feel free to type it in the chat. If you would like to share it yourself, just uh, type in the fact that you'd like to speak or use the raise hand function on Zoom. And after we go through the speakers, we will uh, call on you. Okay. You see my, my the slides now or no? No, we don't see your slides. You should have the ability to slide, to, to show your slides. You Panelist sharing is on, but we don't see your screen right now. I don't know what's, uh-oh. Jill, do you want to send me, if you send, you should be able to, to, is it saying that your screen is sharing? Yeah, I'm just having trouble getting back onto the Zoom. Do you, do you see me now or no? I don't know we why. We see you. We see you just fine. Okay. Okay. And if you're in the Zoom window, if you can just start your screen share again, now that Marty's screen share is over. Okay, great. It says you've started screen sharing. Okay. Um, so, okay, great. And you can you can adjust it to show the full slide if you if you are able to do that. Otherwise, it's fine. We can still see your presentation. But if you can go into slideshow mode, that's even better. Okay, that also works. <laughs> Thanks, Joel. Okay. Thank you. So now I'd like to turn it over to you to uh, make your presentation. Thanks so much and welcome. Okay. Thank you, everybody. I'm actually just got off of a, is there still a hearing going on in the New York State Assembly dealing with NYCHA and COVID and um, privatization. So um, I thought I'd have time to, fin to fine tune this PowerPoint, but we're going to, as you see, the rough cut. So I got a call from Kerry um, being chair, co chair of the Environmental Justice Committee saying, please help us with the environmental human rights presentation to the UN. 
Um, I've had experience years ago, work with Haiti. We helped after the earthquake um, to do a, um, a similar report dealing with Haiti and the earthquake. So um, what I did is I reached out to um, several guild members, including um, a National Lawyers Guild law student at Columbia that's working with us, um, Julia Kirsten uh, Wilkin, um, that helped me put together this materials. I reached out to Andy Reid and others to put this together in a, in a matter of uh, a very short period of time. Um, the environmental main issue has to do with um, climate change. And we saw um, climate change getting worse, the US um, violating uh, most of the rules out there with the poster child for uh, removing itself from the Paris Accords. And it would seem to be a double hit. We just seem to be getting COVID um, increasing. And then as time went on, we realized that um, environmental law enforcement was decreasing in the US and COVID was increasing. And then we also found more and more connections with environmental um, interaction with COVID. As a matter of fact, the particular matter um, not only causes increased vulnerability, but helps carry the COVID virus. So um, we also realized that which countries we had to go seek, and we were very concerned about sea level. So we, we went through the list of countries that would be sympathetic. And it was interesting that we came across a list of small nations, including island nations. And we wrote a letter to, I didn't even know about the country of Kiribati, which is somewhere in the Pacific that has a population of 15,000 people. Unfortunately, they did not answer. Um, but we do realize that we're going to create an alliance with all these small island nations um, that are very, very attuned to um, sea level rise. So we took a little while to get a um, two issue, a two pager. And here's the beginning of our two pager and this is all available on the Dropbox. Um, although emissions in, in some ways, the environmental um, insults were decreasing, but we knew once um, industry and the economy started picking up, things would get worse. And in some areas, especially in areas, the traditional environmental justice communities, people of color, uh, black people and indigenous people and poor have been hit with worse. And now we also know from COVID that the mortality rate is like three times that of, of white America. So we definitely, um, unfortunately, saw the environmental claims that the environmental justice community has been made, meeting for years being verified by deaths. And then we gave the relevant history of all the different um, UN charters, US uh, Declaration of, of, of Human Rights, um, Human Rights and Freedom of Expression. Um, and some of the environmental rights aren't directly um, stated. So we have to do that little um, interplay in terms of right to life includes right to water and right to air. Um, but we figured that the most important thing to deal with the countries we were talking to was to give them some real life stories. All this information in some ways was available to them. Um, I don't think we did, they needed that much legal briefs. I think they really were needed to hear the stories from people on the ground in the US. And as we all know that um, it was the US withdrawal from the Paris Agreement that really set the US back and set us back um, in many, many ways um, in terms of other countries and in terms of our own US policy. And part of the problem we found of dealing on the ground is that it wasn't just the federal government that was, was in, it was the maker of many of these laws um, um, that, to, that was the main initiator of law enforcement and the like. Um, but after a while under the Trump administration, we pointed out that they begin to stop states and um, localities from enforcing the law. So, so much for federalism. And that's one of the issues that we really pushed to our two countries that we spoke to. Um, and we went through the actions taken and not taken. And then we also gave requested recommendations. The US should immediately ratify the Paris Agreement on the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. The US should include climate change impacts 
and environmental justice considerations in any all environmental assessments, and the U.S. should guarantee the right of freedom of expression to environmental activists and bring its laws into compliance with human rights standards. Um, what's good about being a guild um, a a lawyer is wearing the green hat, um, legal observer, as many of us have, um, we're just very familiar with the suppression of, of, of expression. Um, they've, we pointed out that they've actually added um, the word terrorist to most environmental, um, um, I shouldn't say, their word is agitators, we say activists, and um, we did bring that up that there's a major suppression that's going on. So here is um, our panel. The first country we spoke to was Fiji. And it's really good that here's Kurt um, from our Detroit chapter. Um, Natalie Segovia, our um, Indigenous Rights um, Chair, our Columbia Law student, Ayesha Torres, who is our um, head of the um, Tennis Association at Smith, um, a Puerto Rican activist that we've been representing for years. She's been the main fighter um, for um, housing rights and environmental rights of people living in NYCHA housing in Lower Manhattan. And um, here's the, the um, representative from Fiji. And the interesting bit is we try to make it personal and it worked out that our, our Fiji mission um, member and Kurt both went to University of Michigan. So we just, the, uh, there were some discussions of football and University of Michigan on this call. And I think one of the good things is that we talked enough with um, the, the mission member um, to create a dialogue that's gonna be ongoing. We realized that an hour, an hour and a half, we might not be able to, to, um, to convince him um, of major changes and major policy changes um, by Fiji or, or, or statements, but we definitely created this, um, ongoing dialogue, which I think is really important in these, um, in, our, in our work and our activity. Then we went on to another nation that's affected by, by um, climate um, change, including um, a rising sea level. Um, here is the um, representative from the Netherlands. Um, and Natalie added, we got Michelle Cook, who's a member of the Navajo Nation and a lawyer, an activist, a member of the Guild. Um, and we had an hour and a half discussion um, with that member. Um, and we really left it, we try to leave it open for questions, more materials. And we both asked, we asked Fiji and Netherlands um, for other contacts, which they gave us. Um, and who else in, the, in, their, in, their, um, in their missions that we, we, sh should, we should be speaking to. So, um, being guild members, I think we're used to the long haul, not the short haul um, results. So we're still, we're back on that on mission um, of long haul um, goals. This is from Kurt. Um, um, he's worked on basically three cases. Water is a human right. Um, and he pointed out that it wasn't just Detroit, ur the urban problem, but also that that Detroit, uh, Michigan is on um, part of the Great Lakes, which is one of the largest bodies of, of fresh water in the world um, that's being threatened. And it's ironic that it's right, it borders Lake Michigan and those other Lake Superior, um, and yet um, put two of the cases that they worked on in Detroit and in the newer case now in um, uh, Taylor versus the city of Detroit was that people were getting cut off of their water supply for lack of payment, for lack of two, three hundred dollars um, in payment, they were cut off, and in some cases, people end up losing their apartments where the kids been taken away um, for lack of water. Um, this case is is um, is, is pending, and um, it was really good having Kurt um, on board. He's worked with um, um, indirectly um, offering backup on the Flint water crisis. We've taken this information um, from Flint and elsewhere. And we're, we're setting up a brief bank and we're sharing that with all the um, environmental justice chapters um, in the Guild. So I think it's really important to, to, to 
when we do this work is to, to build liaisons and build up um, ongoing connections. Natalie and Michelle, um, Natalie is also the, the, um, the attorney for the Water Protected Legal Collective. So the XL pipeline we pointed out was one of the major environmental threats um, to the US um, in terms of, of environmental damage, in terms of colonial domination, in terms of, in terms of lack of respect at all um, for indigenous rights. Um, so we submitted, um, I think this is a 20 page um, report that we gave them and we talked, um, they talked primarily about um, particular problems of this pipeline and elsewhere. Um, particularly the, um, the suppression of, of the people that were arrested for protesting, um, the, the, the brutality that took place um, and the lack of consultation with indigenous tribes. We did get across that there's a theme to all these cases that we presented that, um, that if there's any type of hearings, it's basically just lip services allowed um, and that which is definitely unequal enforcement of environmental laws in the US that they've been dumbed down in terms of corporations, um, in terms of many of the laws just restrict penalties to just being fines, which is um, minimal or de minimis. And the penalties for protesting has been gone up um, to the level of felonies um, in many cases um, out west and including New York City in some cases. Um, can the cold weather kill coronavirus? Experts say climate doesn't affect the spread of COVID-19. This is sort of a, a, a misnomer. Um, I've been, the last three days, been attending a conference from India on, um, and sponsored by the NIEHS um, on COVID transmission and um, the environmental causes. And there was a belief that the cold, um, the cold coming in is going to st um, st 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 stop the COVID-19 spread. We're finding out that it's going to be the opposite. It's going to make it worse. So um, part of our work is, is what we hope is going to change um, with the new administration. Um, but we pointed out in our report that um, the COVID-19 um, is definitely raises all these environmental non-enforcement actions into some cases inconvenience to cases of, of, of mortality. This is um, Dr. Farmer, who did, Dr. Paul Farmer, um, we cited his work um, about the pandemic devastation, that part of the problem, and most of the problem in the US is that a major underinvestment in public health um, and centuries of social inequality which uh, Marty pointed out, um, but also part of our job of the Environmental Committee um, and the people that spoke was to show that the environmental concerns compound the public health inequality. Um, most of the people who get affected by the particulate matter, by the bad oil, by the bad water, don't have access to health care. And Ayesha Torres, um, I mentioned was um, from Smith Houses. One in 14 people live in NYCHA housing in New York. Um, it's been facing decades of abandonment and adding injury to insult. Um, I think a little history is important. This is right by the Brooklyn Bridge and the East River. Um, these people are really close to 9-11, where, where the World Trade Center, they're where the, the, the public housing complex that got hit the most um, in terms of dust. We were asked by a group called Sydney Center for Independence of Disabled in New York to go see these people after 9-11 because they were basically abandoned by all of New York and there's just a few blocks away from police headquarters and no one from the city saw them. So to this day, they're still suffering from, from, um, from World Trade Center um, fallout. Um, and then Hurricane Sandy came along um, and hit three, four of the buildings and there's a major FEMA grant of $85 million. So the people from Smith brought us back saying that we have a problem, that the construction is gone um, uncontrolled, unfettered, that um, the construction on the roof just opened up the ceilings, just allowing water to pour down upon these people here. 
we went to call 311, which is the New York City Health Department. And the City Health Department said, we don't cover NYCHA residents. They're not part of our jurisdiction. So here, even in New York City, we have, have environmental justice apartheid. Um, what was also critical to this case is that they did bad construction. If you can see the picture on the left, exposing these soils that have the legacy of lead for all those years, all those cars that were, had, had lead in the soils, the World Trade Center dust. As a matter of fact, we also found 85 parts per million of arsenic in a tree well where kids were placing their hands. 16 is the cutoff. We couldn't get the feds, the state, or the city to test until we really pushed. The health department came in um, and then just issued one, um, one report saying that you can't do this and then didn't do any follow-up. The contractor ended up with $85 million despite a $60 million fine that they beat on having bad labor union practices. So what's good about, we, we put this out to the Fiji and Netherlands um, mission to show them what the real stories are out there, um, um, that it's, 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 out, it's rural and, and, and urban, um, and we definitely need um, the United States to do, uh, to do a lot more. Um, and these people are abandoned. Thank you. And we talked, so, good. I'm almost there. Okay, okay. Great. Thanks, Joel. Right. And then we talked about suppression, and I think here there's some uh, NLG people and IADL um, that is on the Donziger case um, representing um, a lawyer that's been slam dunked um, beyond for, um, for speaking out on behalf of the people of, um, and the indigenous people in Ecuador. And then just back to Smith. We just want to show that it's despite all that money that's being spent, that the it's the environmental problems are not just outdoors, indoor, and as everyone has been sequestered, the environmental problems indoor, people have bad air, um, is being compounded um, by living in close quarters and not having um, the proper ventilation and also proper enforcement, enforcing landlords um, and building owners, including the city of New York, to provide the right. Um, ventilation right air. We represent teachers who have broken away from the complacent union and fighting to get the schools rebuilt and, and re-ventilated in a way that is safe. Minorities make up 78% of the US COVID-19 pediatric deaths. And so many studies have shown that um, COVID is hitting people of color three, four times more um, um, than white America. So with all of this that we presented and all the evidence that, that's showing how bad the US is, um, if you read the US report response that um, they have a slightly different view from the White House, the United States and each of the 50 states have strong policies governing protection of the environment. Federal and state laws create both government and private enforcement mechanisms and significant remedies that are available against those who violate them. We take total countenance with them. And to learn a little more about climate rights as human rights, I suggest um, on Thursday that Columbia um, and NYU are sponsoring a conference. Um, and here's uh, thank you very much. Um, we hope to continue our work. And we want to reach out to everyone that's on this um, webinar to, to work with us in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joel. And thank you so much for that informative presentation and for addressing so many of the specific ways in which environmental human rights are being violated in the United States. Um, so with that being said, I'm just going to turn it over now. We're very happy that Jeannie Mirror was able to take some time today while uh, doing immense work to prepare for a really important voting rights case, which was, of course, the subject of her UPR report. Um, to join us today as part of this webinar and uh, that she made the time to do that uh, despite all the deadlines that she's facing. So very honored to turn it over to IC co-chair, IADL president, and uh, voting rights uh, advocate and lawyer, Jeannie Mirror. Jeannie, we can't hear you. I'm sorry.
Jeannie. Jeannie, we can't hear you, I'm sorry. Jeannie, I can't, I can't hear you. There's no sound. Hi, Jeannie, I'm calling you because we can't hear you. There's no sound. Okay, thanks so much. I'm sorry. Okay, bye-bye. Uh, Jeannie's joining us from her phone. So she's gonna try to join us again to make sure to see, make sure that we can hear her. She's going to just rejoin in just a second, um, and just uh, I, while we're waiting for Jeannie to come back, I can just try to make that connection again so that we can hear what she has to say. I just want to once again encourage people to uh, share their thoughts in the chat or if you have any questions or comments. I know Carrie, okay, Jeannie is back on. While we're waiting for Jeannie's audio connection to work, uh, Carrie, I know you have to leave. I just don't know if you wanted to share any final thoughts before you did. Uh, hello. Oh wait, Jeannie, we can okay. hear you. Jeannie, we can okay. hear you. Now, how do Great. I get her back? Okay. Um, uh, here. But yeah, can we hear can hear now? you and that's, we can hear you and that's the most important thing. We can't see you, but we can hear you and that's, and, and the, the most important thing is that we can hear you. So this is I great. I think I'm starting, I think I'm starting my video. Let me see. Yeah. There yeah, I you am. are. Now we can see you and hear you. So this is, this is great. I'm, I'm very sorry, everyone. Um, but I um, wanted to let people know that I started, um, in the last few years, I've been trying to address the issue of voter suppression and exercising everybody being able to exercise their rights uh, to vote. And I, um, I've been looking at that from the perspective of, of course, what's happening in the United States, but also using uh, international instruments. Um, and so last uh, year, um, before the PR of the U.S. was uh, postponed uh, on behalf of the IEDL and the National Lawyers Guild, I submitted a paper um, uh, called The United States Failure to Put in Place Effective Measures to Protect the Right to Vote. And um, I think uh, that paper has been made a, a part of this webinar, so I won't uh, go into it. But um, the main things that I raised in this paper had to do with the fact that that under the uh, Article 21 of the Universal Declaration, everyone has the right to take part in the government of, uh, of his country, or his or her country, directly or through um, freely chosen representatives. And um, that right was codified in the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights in Article 25 that declares every citizen shall have the right and opportunity to take part in and conduct uh, in the conduct of political public affairs to vote and to be elected at genu genuine periodic elections. 
um, under the um, the ICCPR is interpreted by the um, uh, the Human Rights Committee in uh, Geneva, and in Geneva there have been a number of general comments interpreting this um, this um, provision. But one of them is that it requires all member states, which the United States is by having ratified it, to take all effective measures to ensure that people have the right to uh, um, to vote. Having having said that, I posed I, I looked at some of the key ways in which uh, the United States does block the right to vote. And in the paper, I started with the fact that um, many many people in the U.S. do not vote. In fact, uh, I think if there's anything that this election told us is that if you make uh, access to the franchise uh, easier and available so people don't have to stand on um, lines forever, uh, that um, the um, that people will turn out and will actually vote. Um, but in, in fact, in uh, 2016, over 108 million people of the 240 million eligible to vote did not vote. And so one of the things I looked at is the question of why do we vote on Tuesday? And it turns out that um, the election day of uh, the first uh, Tuesday after the first Monday in November is a relic of the um, of our agrarian society in 1845 when uh, the uh, only white men could vote and I, I don't know whether it was just still property right men, white men, but um, November was picked as between planting seasons and it couldn't be on a Sunday because of, of uh, the um, people having to be in church and it could take a day to get to the county seat where you could vote. So they made it the uh, first Tuesday after the first Monday in, um, in November. So, um, and that is when you look at where as you know, people um, where uh, there are the ability to um, uh, vote around the world, most countries have uh, have uh, uh, weekend days, several days, holidays. Um, we, uh, until there's been a push for early voting, um, we really have not uh, in the United States been uh, really interested in people turning out to vote. And as a result, uh, we still have major um, problems uh, with, uh, with voter turnout. Um, so the second thing that I, that I identified in, the, in my report for the UPR was the question of various barriers to voting, and some of which are registration, identification requirements, and so forth. And one of the things that has happened over the years is that um, I think as the right wing has has realized that, um, and when they've realized it for a long time, is that their anti-majoritarian program is not really all that, if, if they actually talk about all of what they want, um, the majority of people won't support it, and therefore they need to keep the number of votes down. Um, and this kind of voter suppression has definitely been uh, uh, used in many, many cases. And I think right after, around the time of uh, the mid 2006, seven period is when states started, a lot of uh, what we might call red states started uh, implementing voter, strict voter ID laws. And um, one of the cases, which was Crawford versus Marion County in Indiana, went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court decided that even though voting was a fundamental right, that they would create a new test which basically vitiated the fundamental right and strict scrutiny of any any uh, limitations on that. So what they have now have is what's called the Anderson Burdick uh, balancing test, where you try to balance the the burden on the voter against the the stated interest of the state. And then the judge gets to personally decide which, which side wins the balance, which has in the last 
uh, years not necessarily fared that, that well. And in fact, it's a perversion of what uh, protecting a fundamental right, which is uh, the right to vote, should mean. Um, in, uh, uh, and so that, that's been a, a main issue. Um, the last issue has to, that I talked about was voter purges. And this is what I'm working on currently. And I've been working with um, investigative reporter Greg Palast on for a long time uh, in which we've laid out, um, we've seen how states, uh, many states try to remove voters uh, from the voter rolls uh, for a variety of things, uh, uh, claiming that they um, have, um, that some of them are, are um, you know, that people have moved out of state. Uh, they use this um, program called the interstate cross check system for a while in which the uh, uh, Chris Kobach from Kansas um, pioneered this as a, as a way in which the, um, um, excuse me, I have to plug in my phone. Sorry, um, sorry. Um, the way in which um, um, uh, this cross-check pro uh, program was uh, states would give lists to each other. They'd compare lists and if somebody who had a similar name appeared in one state, they assumed they moved and they were starting to um, to remove those voters, and um, as a result, <laughs> there was massive purges around around the country using this program. It was exposed by Greg in many ways, and and um, as being faulty, and in fact, uh, discriminating against people of color because 85 of the 100 most common names belong to people of color, like Hernandez or Garcia or. Um, Michael Brown, uh, there's hundreds of them. In any event, this year, um, the case that we currently have against Georgia has to do with the way in which uh, the voters have been purged because uh, it's alleged that they've been, they moved and um, we have evidence to show that they did not move. And so we have filed this case uh, and we are, um, hopefully going to be having an injunction hearing to try to restore the voting rights of 200,000 people who were claimed to have moved in um, in Georgia to the rolls before the, the runoff in, uh, on the 5th of uh, January. So that's basically my report. We submitted this, uh, um, what I said in the, in the UPR statement, we submitted it to, to the um, um, to the to to the committee and before the committee we tried to have conversations about uh with different delegations about uh what's in the report um although everybody was interested in what was going to happen in the u.s election and what was going to happen with voting and whether it's going to whether there's going to be uh you know what we are seeing now is sort of a um uh, Trump refusing to concede and leave and what others are calling the slow moving coup. Um, it's current he, the, uh, the, there did not appear to be any recommendations made with respect to um, the impact of the um, voting purges and uh, um, all of these obstacles to voting, which primarily affect people of color, low income people. And so um, that's actually my short report. I didn't have as much involvement with, uh, we tried to get involvement with other um, delegates and, and missions to discuss it, but uh, did not have significant uh, luck. So that's, that's my report. Thank you so much, Jeannie. Um, Carrie McLean, who uh, was with us earlier today, had to leave. Um, 
But thank you so much for this informative report. We'd like to take any questions or comments that people have. Um, and please, once again, if you'd like to make a question, if you'd like to raise a question or make a comment, um, please uh, do put your question in the chat or please raise your hand on Zoom and we can uh, let you speak or um, you know, indicate that you would like to speak in the chat. Please do one of those things. Um, we did receive a question uh, via email, which was um, a question from Kurt, who was unable to join us today. But um, Kurt says, how can, how can we use the UPR process and other international mechanisms? Um, is there any connection to efforts to encourage US courts to ensure respect for international human rights law that is part of our law because it is in a treaty or because it is customary international law. So this is a question about whether the UP, how the UPR process intersects with attempts to enforce rights um, under international law in US courts. And I know that various people that are part of this program have all been involved in efforts in this regard. So. Um, Jeannie, Marty, Joel, would uh, either one of you, any of you like to uh, comment on this? Well, I'll comment that the UPR process is a process by which we try to get the United States to understand that it has responsibilities under human rights treaties and that it is, is uh, you know, it is to be taking those seriously. Um, the courts, um, you know, the issue of using um, the, um, the the treaties and domestic courts is something that I've been trying to work on. And I think the voting rights area is very ripe for it because of the fact that we have ratified the ICCPR. And um, some months ago, um, uh, several members from the Guild um, Labor Employment Committee, the voting rights um, section of that committee um, wrote an amicus brief arguing that point in the New, New Jersey uh, challenge to uh, expanded voting opportunities uh, in New Jersey. And uh, although the case was dismissed by the court because they said uh, Trump didn't have standing to bring the case, um, we, did our, we did file that amicus brief and I think uh, it's been, is it on the website of the international committee? Charlotte? I believe so. Okay. So I, mean, I, I think that um, in terms of the UPR process, uh, you know, our, uh, it is important uh, in, in the whole picture, but it doesn't necessarily, I don't know. I mean, others might disagree, but I don't know whether ultimately it forces our courts to um, accept what they should accept, especially in ratified treaties such as uh, the Con Convention Against Racism, all forms of racial discrimination, torture, and uh, civil and political rights. Yeah, I wanted to chime in. Um, also, I think that um, of course, the, our human rights um, framework project is av available to help with this. Um, I think mm -hmm. that the issue about the use of human rights law in US courts has to be seen in a much bigger context than as a technical problem, because as we can see from the type of presentations the US government gives at these periodic reviews and in other bodies, there's not really much credit given to put it in a nice way for um, there being any kind of mandatory or ob obligatory change in practices in the US. And I really think that our ability to work with social movements for for rights um, is probably one of our most important functions because it's only through the political process that I think the the elites 
um, failure to recognize human rights will actually be um, forced. And I also think so that some friendly, um, you know, we should be ready to avail ourselves of friendly judges where we can find them um, who will in fact um, honor our human rights commitments. But I think, uh, so we should, we do need to be, um, you know, working to advance um, the use of human rights arguments by guilt lawyers, not just, you know, those of us who are more familiar. Um, and um, my own, you know, I just like looking at the right to health, it's just, or the right to health care, a subset. Um, it's, you know, I feel rather unbelievably discouraged after, what is it now? It's almost a whole, I mean, it's nine months of the worst pandemic in a hundred years. And amazingly, the whole discussion about the right to health care is still sidelined in spite of all the work that human rights activists have done, and at least in the US. And it's clear that you know, our legal approaches are not sufficient, but we have to keep working. I mean, I think working to develop them in conjunction with the movements and helping to bring as lawyers, I think helping to um, find unifying um, areas um, in w so that we can work with um, more of the movements that should be working together because I just don't, I don't see very much um, practical, positive good coming out of this process. I do think though that the U.S. cannot be allowed to go before any kind of international forum and claim that it's the greatest country in the world and respects human rights without being challenged. So we, I mean, I think our role is really is important, but it's just not enough anyway. <laughs> That's my perception. Thanks so much. Um, we have- I just, I just, I just yes. want to add just that we find that it's, it's difficult in courts. If it's a bad judge, we can't even allow um, to use US law sometimes, um, but find a, a way out, um, uh, citing executive orders and the like. But we also find that there's a lot of local groups in terms of local ordinances and re local resolutions, and people have been citing the human rights aspect. And it's a really great organizing tool um, for establishing that beachhead in, in, uh, mm -hmm. in, in legislation and even um, community resolutions. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Joel. And um, actually, the next question, we have um, two more questions as of now. Um, again, if you have a question, please um, do put it in the chat or raise your hand because, um, okay, we've got, uh, just because we do want to, um, we do want to wrap up relatively soon because people have been on for an hour and 20 minutes as of now. But we have our next question is actually for you, Joel. It's from Betsy Cunningham in Baltimore. And Betsy says that she's still most concerned about air quality in private multifamily housing, condos and apartments in Baltimore. Um, she hasn't found anyone in the health department in the state or the city putting any resources toward measuring that and advising condo boards, renters, or unit owners on how to protect from airborne COVID. So I don't know, Joel, if you had any um, practical comment on that or also how that relates to, you know, your international environmental justice work. In the last few weeks, we've been, uh, last few months, we've been working with the teachers, um, trying to establish the fact that the schools are not safe. Um, our main scientists, national hygienist, is part of a few different boards. We're working with OSHA. OSHA has changed their standards. So there's more laws and regulations that um, 
we'll get to, to Betsy um, to use as a wedge. So I think the, um, it's beginning to make some way that, that indoor air quality is, is important, is covered. Um, and it's an uphill battle, but we, there's, we, have, we, we can help. Thank you so much, Joel. Oh. It, and I, I, there's a conference going on um, from India, co-sponsored by the uh, NIEHS, the National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences, and they had several scientists there from Baltimore showing um, air quality problems. So we definitely have some um, Baltimore connections for Bessie to work with. And I think there's a little more hopeful that um, the CDC and the FDA and others um, are more of our allies rather than our, the barrier. Thank you yeah. so much. Uh, thank you so much, Joel. Um, we have a question. Uh, we have Wendy who has raised her hand. So Wendy, I'm going to allow you to talk right now and then you can ask your question or make a comment. Uh, or you've also put your comment in the chat if you'd like me to read it aloud or if you'd like to read it yourself. Wendy? Can you hear me? Very, very, like as if you're very far away. All right, so I, can you hear me better now? Can yes. You me? Okay, great. So um, my question is just going back to the whole part of everything. I go back to this Eisenhower military industrial complex, you know, in 1953, again in 60, and he leaves it with, you know, when you, when you let the military industrial complex take over, you don't have any money for hospitals, you don't have any money, yeah, for, right. you don't have any money for healthcare. And, and, you know, it's humanity hanging on a cross. And mm -hmm. that's what I see that has happened in the US and for all the countries that are arms manufacturers, you know, the five biggest ones are in the US, but all the, a lot of these, a lot of this, these human rights violations seem to come down to, if you, if you back them up, they seem to come down to the fact that, you know, the arms, the military industrial complex is so big and we've lost our values, you know, so that we become conditioned to accept more and more horrific things, children in cages, you know, everybody in prison. And I'm just wondering, you know, if there is, if it could be an effective link with these judges, with anybody. I mean, if, if you guys, I'm not on the front fields. I, I left and went to Portugal in 2017. But, and I'm wondering if, you know, if making that link helps. I mean, Tulsi Gabbard tried to make it and was, you know, kept out of debates and everything as a result. But anyway, I just wondered if you guys, if this is in your mind, you know, this connection with, with all the military invasions and weapons manufacturing, how that has basically corrupted, you know, people's minds. And if that link can be drawn, it, to me, it's like a straight line. Thank you so much, Wendy, um, for your question. And um, would any of the speakers like to speak to or comment on this? Uh, just one brief comment. Um, there is also a human right to peace. It's a collective right. And we don't um, use that as much as we could um, as a way to get at the perverted um, system that we live under in the United States. Um, I think that, of course, the whole, the whole notion of you know, of uh, the high military spending, the militarism that we suffer from here is contrary to human dignity and to, to human rights. But I, you know, we just, we have to keep raising, I think raising the context in which we struggle for human rights. So a human rights movement can't be divorced from the peace movement. It has to be, broad and it has to understand the economic conditions, which is why I like to focus on those when I talk about any 
social, especially social and economic rights, but it's really important to recognize the public policy decisions that are being made that are choosing to uh, forfeit human rights for priorities like, you know, funding the arms contractors. So I don't know, it's, you know, that's a huge issue, but um, we need, obviously need some more creative approaches to addressing that as part of our struggle. I'd like, I'd like to just add that uh, Article 26 of the UN Charter requires com uh, countries to engage in disarmament. Mm -hmm. It's in fact a requirement and uh, it's been ignored like many other articles of the uh, UN Charter. But it's, it's, an, it's one of the most important ones. Mm -hmm. And the environmental <laughs> devastation caused by military operations. I think the U.S. military is the largest consumer of fuel in the country, also. So. Thank you so much. Um, i just checking one more time to see if there are any further questions. If not, I'd like to just ask our, the three panelists who are still with us if they'd like to make any uh, closing comments before we close the webinar for the day. And of course, thank to thank all of our panelists and thank all of our attendees for being part of this conversation today. It is on Facebook, it will be put up on YouTube, and it will be on the website of the National Lawyers Guild International Committee. So um, this will remain a continuing resource for people in the future. And we will send out the links that were put in the chat as well. Uh, Jeannie, would you like to make any closing comments? Um, I, I want to say I'm sorry I didn't get to go to the whole um, uh, webinar. It seems like it was extremely interesting, and um, I think this process has been a good one for the Guild and uh, to go through. Um, in IADL, we do work with a, a lot of countries that are member countries and helping them uh, promote uh, uh, statements, uh, UPR statements, uh, um, when their countries are being um, reviewed. And, and so it is something that we're committed to continuing into the future. Thank you, Jeannie. Um, Mar uh, Marty, would you like to make any final comments? Sure. Um, I just would like to thank everybody for participating and attending. And I wanted to say that I think it's important for us to um, continue to engage in um, discussions about what are ways that the, um, the Lawyers Guild can um, work directly um, with the United Nations system to advance human rights. And one area I hope that we will be considering in the near future is um, gaining consultative status with the UN and I also note that those provisions that the Guild oh so long ago um, was one of the you know, instrumental groups in getting into the charter do allow for more, for creative possibilities for the future, uh, for new ways of us to engage. And obviously it would be important to work with other organizations to do that. But I think there's a lot more potential there for building alliances across national borders and with um, larger part of civil society um, around um, our human rights. So I look forward to thinking about new ways of um, interacting in the future. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. And thank you, uh, Hillary, for putting that comment from Amnesty. Also, before we take uh, our final comments from Joel, I just want to also encourage people, if you are in the NLG International Committee, that we have a human rights framework project that it would be great if you're interested in working on these things for you to become a part of, um, to be working on the, the issues that we're discussing today, of course, to join the Environmental Justice Committee as well. And if you're not, of which Joel represents, and if you're not part of the International Committee, um, to please 
visit the national website at nlg.org or visit our website at nlginternational.org and become uh, a member of the NLG and of these committees that are doing such great work. So with that being said, I'd like to turn to Joel for your closing comments of the day. I just want to um, echo um, Marty's um, statements. I really think it's important that the Guild come together, which we did today. And I guess on the hopeful side is that we are creating alliances and the alliances that we've, we're just forming now with, with the New York Nurses Association, um, we're dealing with um, Engineers Without Borders and the like, and all of these people play key roles in a lot of these cases in terms of getting people a voice. And um, I urge people to participate in, in future programs that the Joint Environmental Committees, the Environmental Human Rights and the Indigenous Committee and the Environmental Justice Committee um, is gonna have. And I think it's important for all of us to just monitor what's out there um, and just keep on working together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you again to Joel, Marty, Jeannie, and Carrie for joining us today. Thank you to all of our participants who participated today. We'll be in touch with you. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us as we continue to build this work to hold the US accountable for ongoing human rights violations inside the United States and around the world. Thank you again to everybody and have a great afternoon.